Mate, right, mate, you're much better looking than your brother, eh? <laughs> I've just cleaned up today for you, so yeah, I was, starting to, I was starting to look a bit like him, and then I was like, nah, nah, get rid of it. Mate, brilliant, mate. But you, um, mate, thanks. This is called The Lockdown Show. Do you get it? Because we're locked down. Yeah, no, I do get it. Yeah, yeah of course, you. of course. But, <laughs> mate, it's, it, it's, uh, it's really interesting, actually, because I was hearing whispers about your book it's called fringes it's not the fringes it's fringes right make sure we get it fringes right. yeah and we can we can we can, uh, we can get into it and then heard whispers about it and then read your article on rugby pass and then the momentum that's gathered it made the article's gone down really well so before we get into the book because i'm not a massive reader and that's why i was asking you the certain bits that i should try and read it's taken me about 10 hours to read two chapters but <laughs> um like genuinely I, I i laughed out loud on on uh, on one of the chapters that we can get into as well because i, I thought it was brilliant stories that I heard you mention in the article that, that Ruby Pass published where you said that you were t- talking about some of your experiences with friends and that was kind of what gave you the push what were them and the stories that you were initially saying so what what were the experiences that they were listening to and thinking hang on a minute that you need to write a book on this because this is either this is gold it's ridiculous or these are stories that people need to hear what story was it or what what part of your journey was it that, that they thought w- would work well, it was interesting because we were actually, we were down in Cornwall, all of, all of us on holiday and um, they'd actually all been over and watched a game in Rouen and it was funny because it was one of the games in the football stadium, so you had a big crowd and, um, you know, brass band, the lot, you know, kind of half-time entertainment, really going for it. But then we only had two match balls and we had a really big kicker and there's kind of net at one end or something. So they were like, well, this is weird because... Everything about it is professional, but then you've got two balls. So there's like two teams sort of stood there waiting, <laughs> waiting for someone to bring the ball back. And there's all these weird, um, they didn't quite appreciate quite how brutal the sort of day to day can be. So we're talking about specific kind of tackling drills or things around uh, like ridiculous things that make it into the book around like how unprofessional the sort of drug testing um, sort of uh, process was. And they were just looking at me and they're like, you know, is this, this actually happened? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so they were, that kind of seeded the idea for me. And once I had a bit of material and was considering kind of jumping over the edge, I bumped into an old uh, school friend and she was kind of ghostwriting and putting her own book together. She's a historian. And she actually, um, you know, I sort of floated my idea past her and she was like, I don't care about rugby at all, but that sounds really interesting. You should do it. <laughs> because some of the things that I'm sure you speak about in the book, but one of the good things to talk about is is a lot of people who follow rugby uh, follow it at the highest level, um, the Premiership, mm. the Top 14, the Guinness Pro 14, and naturally the internationals. Now, that is the pinnacle of players' careers, but actually to get there doesn't necessarily re- revolve around if you're good enough. And I had lots of mates. I played in the championship with Nottingham for years. I was in the Leicester Academy with players that were significantly better than me. There's a lot of luck along the way. You've got to stay um, injury-free. You have to have the coaches that like you. There's a lot of politics that go around in the rugby circles, I'm sure, in any other sport. But it is difficult to make it at the highest level. I'm right, I'm right in saying, I know your brother uh, had a very good career as well, but I'm sure you, you've got friends as well that would say the same, that it's not easy to make it to the highest level, not because you're not good, just because timing doesn't fit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you say, it's, it's the highest level, so it's the most competitive. There's only one England place, you know, for each position, and even then in the squad. So I talk about it a little bit in the book. So if you think kind of just like pretty basic maths, it's probably wrong, but there's about 500 kind of top flight contracts, and those are across all the positions and um, and kind of, if you're if you've got one of them in your position, you're probably like one of the best 50 people in in your job, which is kind of amazing. Um, but it just means that yeah. So outside the top 50 in any profession, there are people who are really good. But you know, with rugby, because there aren't many of those contracts, there are a lot of good guys, like you say, who who don't necessarily get to step it up. But I, I, I talk about it as well. I think there is a band of guys who either athletically or skill wise or, or or both are better, and you need. To to kind of respect that there are some like amazing you know some guys are amazing and um you know we all know who they are really but kind of beneath that there may be a load of guys who are who who are kind of similar and like you say you know one break away or a coach really believing them or getting injured at the wrong time you know can make a big difference and then off the back of that as well like that group of guys which is the masses which you know you're not your top tier of world-class or international class players 
they're the lads at the coal face actually scratching around to try and make any kind of money. It's not as if you make money. It's not like in the football, in the championship, or even the leagues below that, where you'll get paid a hefty amount of money where you can afford a mortgage, a nice car, and you can afford to live a good life. Actually, and I know from experiences playing in the championship, and you, I saw extracts from your book and, and what you said as well, the, the kind of fall off in terms of finances is pretty significant. So trying to make money as a rugby player, if you don't make it to the highest level, it is pretty difficult, eh? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I think particularly, I mean, in England, for sure, like you say, in the championship, there are a couple of teams where you might earn a pretty decent crust and then there are actually quite a lot of them where you really won't. And, you know, some people are sort of like, well, you know, why don't you play part time? And quite often those championship teams, they, they're full time environments and, you know, you're there every day, you're knackered, you're, you're training, you're trying to kind of, you know, not get hurt. You're trying to sort of cast around looking for another contract. They, they tend to run 11 months, so you've got no kind of employment law protection. And, yeah, it's, it's just like, it's pretty precarious, really. So your experience is, France. I played in France for a year. I played in Montpellier. And I suppose it's something that I don't really speak about much. If people ask me what my experiences were like in France, if they were probably very similar to yours, but you've gone into a lot more detail. Mine was, it was a great place to live, the sun out, by the beach, but actually, the professionalism was so far, it was almost laughable. <laughs> and one of the, one of the chapters that, that, that I was recommended to read, The Athletic Capacity, probably sums it up in that chapter in terms of the nutrition. You mentioned the drug testing. So when you got off the plane in France, and it was Rouen, was that, you, that, that was your first club there, right? So how do you even get there? Yeah, how, that's how, the only how, team I played for. How, how do you even get there? So, so, so talk me through the airport you left and how you actually got to some of these places are ridiculous to get to. So tell me how you got there. And then also when you arrived, having been there a week or two day, uh, two weeks to settle in, what went through your mind? We, um, yeah, we, so me and my friend Luke Cousins, so he's from Round Bath as well. And we both flew from Bristol together. So we flew to Paris and uh, Richard Hill, who's coaching, he picked us up and took us back, kind of deposited us in this apartment that was like pretty sparsely furnished. And we had a kind of bag or two of gear and he took us out for dinner. Next day was like, right, you know, we'll get going. And, but there wasn't really a lot to get going with. So there was sort of weights in the morning, but at that point the team were, they were a project team and we'd been signed as kind of the first full-time guys. So really there was only sort of five or six of us. And then we trained in the evening and the first session was because uh, they were redoing the pitch at our usual ground. We went to a public park, which was sort of out of town a bit and opposite the football stadium. And, and it was a mix of A and B team players and the standard and the sort of get, you know, put your boots on the car, run over, do training. And I was thinking like, what have I done? And I'd, I'd come from Cornish Pirates and that was a really like organized, you know, regimented. The day was like, bam, 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 you know, kind of properly a, a professional player in England would kind of, uh, be able to identify with that but yeah I was, I was like what's happened and I was thinking I, I've made a, <laughs> I've made a big mistake um, and then we actually kind of got off quite lightly because we, we we had an English coach so we could have a pretty you know clear dialogue with him but you hear horror stories of guys going to French teams with French coaches and they and they can't speak French and they get there so that they don't have a clue what they're doing and I mean in the second year we had a guy Ed Barnes who used to play for Bristol I think was the yeah, in the UK. And he played for a couple of other French teams. And he arrived in the middle of the night with a kind of wife, newborn baby, um, turned up to an apartment with no furniture in it, no running water, no electricity. <laughs> it was oh, just word. like, hang on, what, what's going on? You know, it's, those stories are quite common, I think, when you turn up in France. I don't know what yours was like. Mine was slightly better than that. But in terms of the professionalism, that was the thing that got me. It was... One thing was nutrition. So when I had, when I played for Scotland for years and, and played played against France was actually how big and how thick set and how robust the guys were. But then when I got there and I saw the kind of food they were eating and, and you spoke about it, the guy eating a Kit Kat, literally that for for breakfast, that's what it was. So we we'd go out and train at eight o'clock in the morning and I you know, I was I was professional, I was in the prime of my career. So I wanted to kind of have a have an extended career with Scotland as well. So I made sure that everything was in place. But we'd go out and train at 8 o'clock in the morning. Train starts at 8. Fabian Gautier was our head coach. Some days he wouldn't he wouldn't be there and we'd, we'd have to come <laughs> back in the afternoon and train. 
But if we went out there and trained and you'd run mindlessly for for an hour and a half, which is which is long, you'd come in and then you're thinking, right, food, what are we having? You know, are we having eggs? Are we having yeah, chicken? Are we having steak? Are we having fish? No, nope, you're having a bowl of cereal. And if you're lucky, you might get a yogurt with it. And I just couldn't believe it. And the lads are lapping it up and lapping it up. And, you know, it got to the stage where my final week there was my last memory was Rennie Ranger, who was the All Blacks 13, who they'd signed on mega money, walking out to training in his slippers with a cigarette in his mouth around all the coaches and all the players. And I thought, yeah, I'm off to Saracens now. But, <laughs> you, you, like, it just actually shows the, the quality. Because, because rugby in France is huge, hey? Did you find mm. that even in the lower levels in terms of how well-supported and how tribal and part of the, the kind of culture it was? Yeah, it was amazing. So, I mean, the in the lower division, when we started, so we got the team promoted and then the, a year or two after I left, they got promoted again. But the, I mean, some games would be in front of sort of no one in a park, but then another game would be packed out ground. Yeah, brass band, they're all loving it. Um, you're getting kind of heckled on the way in. It was great. Like, it's, um, it's so well supported, like you say. Uh, but the, um, I know exactly what you mean with, some of the sort of behavior that's allowed by the lads. So before one of our preseason games, I think the first preseason game that we had, everyone sort of tabbing away, drinking little coffees out of plastic cups. And there was a, there was a pre, uh, not preseason, so mid-season training camp we actually had in Brighton um, over New Year. And we did our morning sessions and then, like say, going for lunch. It's at Hove Rugby Club. And um, a couple of the lads just drinking pints. So, so just have a few pints with, with lunch. And then we're going back out for training in the afternoon. I was looking at them. I was thinking, like, is anyone going to anyone gonna say anything about this? And it was like, nah, fair enough. Let's let's go. No, it was crazy. So Mamut Gorgogsi retired. So Godzilla retired this week. And uh, we're sharing stories. Why not? Um, they could go into your next book. But I remember, <laughs> so I was at Gloucester before I signed for Montpellier. And I had this one off-feet session on a rowing machine that I kind of do all the time. It's my go-to session. And there was one rowing machine at Montpellier. So I used to go in on a day off or when I wanted to do extra conditioning. And it was basically, so you, so you tie, it, it would be a, like a ladder. So it would be like 3,000 metres, 2,000, um, 1,500, all the way down to 250. And they would, they would record your distance or your time to, uh, that you take to row that distance. And they'd mark them down. The conditioning coach perked up. He was like, oh, I really like that. And started <laughs> using it, started using it with the guys that were injured. And it got to the stage where the, they found that session so hard that when Mamut Gorgogzi did it, someone saw him clipping the wire to the back of the <laughs> rowing machine. So they couldn't work out how long how long it, uh, it took him to do the time. So what they did instead is they used my times, what it took me to do that. And that's what they used. So you'd be on the rowing machine for seven minutes, then six minutes, then five minutes. So you wouldn't work out. And you saw them on there. And they were literally rowing as if they were just in a, in a rowing boat just to go meet their mates. It was ridiculous. So, you know, some unbelievable experiences there as well. But when you look look back on it, are you glad you had them experiences? So, you, so you've, when, when you're writing the book and you're talking about sometimes when you're in it, it, it's quite difficult. But when you look back on it, how would you feel like it shaped your life massively now because of the book, but in terms of personally away from that? I, I always wanted to go to France and um, and have that experience. You know, when you're a young player and you think, oh, you know, try and, try and get out to one of the big teams. I didn't manage to do that, but I absolutely loved it for the most part. I mean, at the end, it was a little bit sour because, you know, the team started paying us late and it was a bit, it was a bit fraught. But actually, yeah, when people ask me, I'm like 90%. It was absolutely brilliant. I love the country. I love the, you know, kind of the culture around sitting down and eating a meal together, even if it's compote and cereal. Um, but yeah, I, abs- I thought it's fantastic and it's, it's a bit of a shame. I don't know about how things are going to turn out, obviously, but I hope that other people could have a similar experience and go over there and do it because you go over there, it's obviously a bit alien and you've got to kind of take it easy when you first get there and be like, right, okay, don't get too wound up about this, just like ease in. And then once you get into the rhythm of it, you can start, you know, you can be as professional as you like and you know, that might rub off, rub off on other people. But yeah, for the most part, I just thought it was it was great. Brilliant. And then, so let, let's just go back to the book. So you finished the book, um, all the punctuations in there, it's correct, all the spellings uh, are done. <laughs> At what point did you realise and did you think, right, this is ready to go out into the public domain, um, ready to, ru- you know, ruffle a few feathers? And so when did you realise that? And then what processes do you go down there? Because 
know, I've been listening to a couple of podcasts and stuff with, with authors in America who, who, who write books. It's not easy to publish a book, is it? No. So, I mean, what I should say is that it's a self-published book. So when, in the first place, when I once I had a decent amount of material, I um, approached a few publishers and or agents and they've all got a slightly different submission process. And those aren't easy things to do. You can't just sling them a sling them a sort of 10 page PDF. You have to kind of it has to be quite a lot of work. So maybe like 100 pages or particularly if you're a no, a no name author like me. Um, and one guy was really helpful. He was a, he's a sports kind of um, sports book agent for the most part, I think. And he was like, look, you know, rugby is quite a small book market. It usually only comes out for kind of big name players. So he was like, look, you know, it's going to be very difficult for you to sell it. But, you know, your writing's pretty good. You could definitely improve it, but it's pretty good. And um, I think self-publishing would be really good for you. And I was like, OK, so that meant that I got to keep the control over it as well. And once I got it back from the editor, which was, um, you know, uh, I actually gave it to a mate beforehand to read. And he was like, oh, if, you know, if you had this edited, I was like, no, I've just been through, like, just trying to make sure I hadn't spelled anything wrong. And actually, I was quite pleased with myself. And then when the editor gave it back to me, it had something like a thousand uh, corrections. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> but, yeah. And then after that, once I, once I did those and I spent, she, she spent a couple of months doing that. Uh, and then after that, I, um, I got it back and I did, I did that, but I worked on it quite slowly. And then in the end, I was, I'd kind of been dragging my heels over it. I was a bit scared about putting it out there, to be honest. And, um, just in case nobody bought it or everyone thought it was terrible. And, um, in the end, I, you can kind of format it for as long as you want and you, and it's quite complicated. And I think the worst thing would be for somebody to download it or someone to buy it and it, for it to be in a mess. And in the end, I just bought like a good bit of software for you know a couple of hundred quid. And I was like, right, you know, this will actually make it look good. It'll turn out properly. I got a really good cover designed and um, yeah. And then I put it out in December. So I was hoping people might buy it for Christmas. <laughs> and did they? A couple of people did. Yeah, not too bad. It got up into the, it was, it was sort of, it wasn't in the main chart, but it kind of made a bit of an impression then. Mm. But since then, since the, there's been some decent reviews and it looks a bit more legit, then um, then it's had a bit more success, which has been great. See, and you, you talk about that in a, in a kind of humble stance, which is lovely. But I'm right in saying it's up there. I don't know how they categorise in terms of uh, you know top books or is it top ten or so. What's the actual uh, system that it goes through? Because Eddie Jones's books come has come out, Warren Gatlin's book has come out. Obviously, goes written along the way, but yours is taken off massively just talk us through the process of that actually how it gets to where it gets to is it the amount of people that read it is it the reviews is it you know just talk us through that process i think it's really interesting yeah no i think the the reviews are super important for um so if you have read it and you like it then please leave one oh, 100%. Uh, but yeah the um that just helps with the visibility and and obviously anyone who then comes across it it looks really legit they're a lot more likely to buy it and um, I don't know exactly how the algorithm works, but there's the digital copy, there's the print copy, which um, actually when you buy it, it, it's printed and delivered to you from a kind of Amazon facility. There are no, I don't have like, you know, copies at home that I'm oh, posting. Okay. They're printed and sent like straight from a, um, straight from, you know, whichever warehouse, which is really helpful if you're like a, if you're a new author, you know, you don't have to put any money down up front. Amazon obviously take a percentage, they, they cover their cost um, in the, you have to kind of price that in. But if people want to buy it, how do they go about getting it? Yeah, you go on Amazon and uh, Fringe's Life on the Edge of Professional Rugby. And at the minute, it's it's been exclusive to Amazon since its release. And I'm going to look into seeing, now it's kind of taken off a little bit. And maybe if I can get it translated into French or potentially, I'd love to see it in a bookshop. So I'm kind of looking at some different options uh, you know, with respect to that. But for the moment, Amazon's the only place you can get it. And has anyone been in contact who've read it? So it's not translated in French yet, but I think when it does get translated in French, you might be getting a few phone calls. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, there's, I don't think there's anything that's too bad. I mean, like a couple of the lads is interesting. Um, since writing the book, a couple of them have gone to the top 14. So one of them's in, one of them's in cast and actually they won the league last year maybe but um and the other's gone to Toulon so he did well with the French sevens and he's gone to Toulon and he's uh, he's not played too much yet but it's interesting you'll kind of catch them when they're they're not quite so polished brilliant 
But Mercer, thank you very much for coming on the lockdown because we are locked down to talk about your book, mate. It's brilliant. Cheers, Jim. Thanks for having me. It was great. Thanks, mate.